Um, with that, uh, let's get on to the star of the show. Um, our guest tonight, Dr. Jason Wexstein. I don't call him doctor, I call him Jason. Um, he's known to those of us <laughs> who traveled with him, including uh, Lake Hook members who joined him on a trip to Cape May a few years ago. We just call him Jason. And um, some of you may remember that Jason was a staff scientist at the Field Museum. He was there till about 2014. And today he's an associate professor in the Department of it's a big name, Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and Associate Curator in the Department of Ornithology at Drexel's Academy of Natural Sciences. I could go through a long list of his accomplishments. He's got a long resume, but I'll just say enough to make you jealous at a time when none of us can travel, which is that he's conducted research on birds and their parasites in the United States, Canada, South Africa, Ghana, Malawi, Nicaragua, Brazil, and Mexico. So with that, Jason's going to take us on an armchair trip to one of the most endangered areas of Brazil where almost no one has ever gone. So let's sit back and enjoy the ride. Thanks, Rena. Let me uh, get the screen share going here. Let's see. I think if I do this, oops. Hang on, let me. I'm just realizing that I have to move some things out of the way. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Now I should be able to do this. Oops. It's tricky with the, I have two screens, so yeah. it takes me a yeah. second to do the. Okay. Okay. Two screen thing here. Okay. Now. Can you guys Go all ahead. see that? Yep, we're good. Okay, perfect. Okay, now I can slide this back into place. So I'm looking at your faces. So um, what I want to do today is talk about a trip that um, that I actually took while I was at the Field Museum. So you're, you're going to actually see people that you know, like Josh Engel, those of you that know Josh Engel. Um, was on this trip. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the project first, and then we'll get into the expedition and, and I'll show you some birds and other creatures that we that we encountered on the trip. So um, our project was a National Science Foundation funded project to basically survey birds and parasites in southern Amazonia. And this is a project that I continued on when I got here to Drexel in 2014, but it was something that I started at the Field Museum with John Bates. And um, this was our first expedition that was part of this NSF funded project. And basically what I'm gonna do is take you on that expedition. And the expedition went to really the most endangered part of Amazonia. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, why it's endangered and, and why it matters that we were going to this place to study the birds there. So these are some of the players in this project. So, um, those of you that, um, well, many of you probably know John Bates. I assume you guys have had John talk with you in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so John has been my partner in a lot of work in Amazonia for many years. And so has Alexandre Alesho. So Alex Alesho was a graduate student at LSU when I was doing my PhD there um, in um, the late 90s, uh, and that's, you know, the late 1990s. And um, Alex then went on to become a curator at the Museo Gelbi, which was my partner for many years. Now he's actually moved on to Finland. So he's out of Brazil, um, but we're still working in Brazil with other partners. Um, and then Vassal Katch is, you'll see him in a lot of the photos. He's an endoparasitologist. So he's a guy who studies the tapeworms, the roundworms, the little icky things that live inside the guts of these animals. And he's one of the world's experts on these things. He's, he's published papers on all kinds of different things, including malarial parasites, one of the focal groups that we studied for this project. And then Michel Balim is an ectoparasitologist. So one of the groups that I do a lot of work on are chewing lice that live on the feathers of birds. And Michel was a postdoc at the Field Museum, and he's still a collaborator of ours on these projects. Um, and, um, and he worked at the Field Museum as a, as a postdoc studying some of the material that we collected on these trips. And then when I got here to, um, to Philadelphia, I had two more postdocs that worked on aspects of this project. So Alain Fecchio is um, an expert on malarial parasites and he's a Brazilian researcher and Victor Piacentini also um, Brazilian. They both came here on Brazilian fellowships to work on collections that were made as part of this research project. 
and they study different aspects. So Victor is more is an ornithologist. Alain is really a truly a parasitologist, although he studies only parasites of birds. So why why study parasites at all? Um, why do, why does this matter? Um, one of the one of the sort of the little factoids that I like to tell people is that 30 to 70 percent of life on Earth is parasitic. And that seems like a pretty wide breadth, right? Is it 30%? Is it 70%? Why, why do we have this wide breadth and this estimate of how many things are parasites? Well, one of, the, one of the issues is that some of these critters that we call symbionts that live on and in other organisms, some of them, we don't really know whether they're parasitic. The definition of a parasite is something that has a negative effect on its host. And a lot of these things, we don't know. We assume they're negative, but we don't know. Um, and an example of that might be this little thing right here in the middle. This is a feather mite. It turns out a lot of feather mites just feed on fungus on the feathers. So maybe they actually have a positive effect on the host. We don't really know. It hasn't been quantified in most of these things. So the, the bottom line here is that a huge proportion of life on Earth is parasitic. We know very little about it. And um, I think you know those of us who are, well, all of us that are sitting here in this Zoom presentation are, in a sense, affected by not, not a parasite, but a pathogen that's a lot like this. We have all these unknown pathogens and parasites out there. And if we don't go out and figure out what they are and where they are and who they live in, we get surprised by things like the COVID um, emergence that happened that's, that's led us to be stuck in our homes for months and months on end. So uh, this is one reason to study these things. The other, the other reason is that it helps us to understand the basic principles of parasite transmission, which also helps us understand the basic principles of, of disease transmission. And this, is, this, this image on the slide is just an image of all kinds of different parasites that you might find on a bird. So I'm a crazy birder like all of you are. Um, those of you who are on our, our Cape May trip know that. But also when I'm looking at a bird, I'm also a crazy parasitologist. I'm thinking like, is anything known from that bird? What lice is it known to have? What, um, you know, have hippobosid flies ever been found on it? So, these guys on the left side here are, are a couple of the different kinds of lice that are found on birds. Um, this is a hippobosid fly, which is a flat fly that moves underneath the feathers. And some of these lice can actually ride on these hippobosid flies like a little bus and move between birds. There are mites that live on these hippobosid flies part of their life cycle. They lay their eggs on the hippobosid. And when that fly lands on a bird, the eggs hatch and the mites transmit onto the bird. Um, these, these Flies also feed on blood from birds and they can transmit some of the malarial parasites that birds carry. And this is just an example of a malarial parasite in a bird red blood cell. So a lot of these parasites have things that are connected to each other in terms of their life histories and how they get around and how they interact with each other. And then we have tapeworms and flukes. And this is a nematode that lives inside the blood of a bird for part of its life cycle. And this is just a smattering of the things that are on and inside birds. And if you looked at yourself with a microscope, you would also find some of these things. You know, humans have four different species of lice found on them. We have all kinds of mites. If you scrape the skin on your face and look at it under a microscope, chances are you have mites and you, you probably share them with your spouse. Um, so um, lots, of, lots of these critters have connections to our, our lives too in a lot of different ways. So one of the things that, um, that comes with doing surveys of these kinds of critters is that you really have to do field work in a different way. So um, normally when museum practitioners go into the field and do research, they're just preparing, you know, they're going out there, they're euthanizing birds to, that, that they're going to collect, and they prepare specimens from those. But we had to have a very careful workflow to make sure that we could collect all of the materials off of these specimens. In a sense, we were getting maximum usage out of these specimens by sampling them for so many different things. And that required a specially designed workflow where we would collect blood samples, make all kinds of microscope slides of those blood samples, preserve the blood. We would attach special tags so that we could trace the bird on the carcass through this whole process of dissection so that we could then properly label all of these little ancillary materials that come out of these kinds of collections. So this is just sort of the general workflow of how that happens. So what do we discover on these kinds of trips? Well. Part of this project, not this specific expedition, but this general project involved the description of new bird species. So during the time of this NSF funded project, we described three new species of birds. Two of these were side bills, which are wood creepers found in Amazonia. We used DNA data in part and specimens to help differentiate these from other populations um, and um, found that there were these unique forms. Um, if any of you have Handbook of the Birds of the World, there was one of the volumes that had a bunch of bird descriptions in it and these two were described there. 
And then we also described a new species of barbet. And this was from Peru. Um, this was named after John Fitzpatrick at, um, at Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And um, you know, these are three of the bird descriptions that came out of, of the work that we did. And there are, there are more, more that benefited from the field work that we did. There were also lots of parasites described. And these are just a few examples. This is a new genus that was named after a colleague of mine. Named, we named it after Ricardo Palma, who is um, an insect curator in New Zealand, who's a world expert on lice. And he's a really, really great guy and didn't have a genus named after him. So we, we named this thing palm, Palmielis inexpectatus. So it basically means like unexpected little palmine. And Ricardo's a, a little guy and is, was totally excited and honored by this. What was cool about this, one of the reasons we named it Inexpectatus is it comes from this, this group of birds called trumpeters, which you guys are used to seeing sandhill cranes fly through the Chicago area. These are basically crane relatives that are endemic to the Amazon. And each interfluve, and we'll learn more about what interfluves are in a minute, but they're basically the areas between rivers around the basin. Each interfluve, these air, areas of land around um, between rivers, has its own species of trumpeter in it. And there were two lice known from these trumpeters. Well, we found this third thing. It's very rare. There aren't very many of them on any given bird, usually only one or two. And we were able to collect some. And then we actually went into the field museum's bird skin collection and were able to find more on those specimens, enough that we could describe this new genus and species. And then from Katingas, we described a whole bunch of new species of this louse in the genus Cotingacola, one we named after Josh Engel. So it's one of the dubious honors that you get if you're friends with a parasitologist, you eventually get a parasite named after you. So Josh has this, this louse from a black-necked red katinga, which is a really cool bird. Um, so he has the louse named after him. And then Holly Lutz was an undergrad that worked with me at the Field Museum. Then she went on to be um, a lab technician, then went on to do a PhD and eventually came back as a postdoc at the Field Museum. And we named a louse after, after her too, and, and lots of others. So these are just a smattering of examples. The other thing is we really learn a lot about the diversity of things. So Michelle and I started a project where we were trying to just describe all the species of this genus called Mercidia, which is a really common perching bird louse. And basically what we found out was that there are only 29 species of this genus found in the country of Brazil, but based on figuring out how many hosts had not had one of these things described off of it. So they're very host specific. Every host species has its own Mercidia basically. And by counting up the number of perching birds that don't have records, we basically figured out, we estimated with kind of some back of the napkin calculations that there are about 930 species of Mercidia in Brazil, basically two times the number of known lice from Brazil just in this one genus. So this, is, this basically means there's a, a huge amount of undescribed diversity out there. This is just a way of basically estimating what we don't know out there in nature. And this is one genus. So imagine if we did this for every genus of louse, there are thousands of unnamed species out there. And this is one of the cool things about working on parasites is there's so much that we don't know. And then we did a lot of work on avian malaria parasites. And this is just a map showing these little areas of endemism. One of the things we, we studied was um, are the parasites found in these specific areas, just like birds are only found in these specific areas? Um, are there differences in the prevalence of these parasites, like how common the parasites are in hosts in these different places? So a lot of, we, we, we were able to ask a lot of different um, but fundamental questions about parasite biology using these malaria um, screens that we did, basically these big malaria surveys that we did across the entire basin during this project with collaborators. And a lot of fecchio, was and still is a part of that. So I'm actually editing two manuscripts that I'm working on with Allah. The guy never stops working on this stuff. He's, he's, he's a workhorse and a really great collaborator. And then we do studies of coevolutionary biology. And that basically, probably in other talks like that John Bates has given, he's shown you these genealogies. These are like, these are like your family trees. These are trees of life. So the one on the left happens to be a tree of toucans basically showing how different species of toucans are related to each other. The one on the right is a tree of lice. And basically we compare whether or not these trees are like each other to understand whether the parasites speciate with their hosts over evolutionary time, or whether there's a lot of transmission back and forth between species. And this helps us understand the deeper evolutionary history and interactions between these parasites and hosts. So that, this gives you just an idea of the smattering of different things that we do with these kinds of, um, of surveys. And there's really a lot more that we can do as well. 
Um, and I should point out the other exciting thing about this is not only are we doing this research, but specimens of the parasites and specimens of the birds are going into museum collections. So they're going into Brazilian collections, American collections. And what that means is they're available for other researchers to use. So not only are we using them, but other people will use them for hundreds of years to do all kinds of interesting research. So why is Amazonia interesting? Um, if, if I could see everybody's hands, I'd ask you to raise your hands and you know, show me how many of you have been to Amazonia. Um, and I would guess that if you've been to Amazonia, you've probably been to Peru or Ecuador, maybe Brazil, um, maybe Bolivia, but most people haven't been to everywhere in Brazil or everywhere across the Amazon. And if you really wanna see all the Amazonian species, you have to do that. And I'll explain to you why that is in a minute. Now, this is sort of a typical overview flight of a pristine part of Amazonia. It looks like, you know, unending forests of green. I mean, it's one of the most exciting things to fly over from my perspective is just huge tracts of wilderness. And the Amazon is the, largest, most intact tropical forest ecosystem on the planet. Of course, that is changing and it changes every day and it's getting sadder and more hacked to bits as, we, as we're talking right now. Um, and this is a map of the areas of endemism of Amazonia. So it turns out that Amazonia is not a green carpet. Um, there is a lot of green, but it's not uniform. And that can be at the local scale when we're talking about habitats. There are lots of different microhabitats in any given place, lots of different soil types and different forests grow on different soil. But more importantly, these regions are bounded by major rivers. So you've got the big Amazon River. And if you're Brazilian, you don't call it the Amazon up to Peru. You call that the Solomois. Whoops, um, gonna go back here. Um, and then there are a bunch of major tributaries. And any of these tributaries, the Madeira, the Tapajos, the Xingu, the Tocantins, all of these rivers are bigger than our biggest river, the Mississippi River. These are huge rivers. Like there are places on the Amazon you cannot see across the river. The mouth of the Tapajos, you cannot see across the river. This is a very large, large, large river. Um, these areas around the mouth, huge areas. You would not want to go in a small boat in those areas. The waves can get big. So the bottom line is these rivers are barriers. And a lot of the birds do not cross these barriers and do not fly across these major rivers. And as a result, each of these named areas on this map, the Guian and Shield, Belen area, the Xingu area, the Tapajos, Rondonia, and Ambari and Napo, these are all areas where about half of their diversity is found only in those areas. So in other words, if you go to the Inambari, about half the species that you see there, you wouldn't see in the Rondonia area. And the more we study, the more we're finding that this pattern holds up. So we study widespread birds and we find out that they're genetically different in these areas. And what that means is that you can't just preserve an area in, in Ambari. You're not preserving all the diversity in the Amazon that, that way. We need to preserve areas in all of these major areas of endemism. And this is a problem. And it's a problem because of, of forest destruction. Forest destruction is uneven across the basin. So this is a picture of forest destruction. And this is based on a study that Bill Lawrence did. And basically, this was um, supposed to be an estimate of degradation by the year 2020. He published this in 2001. And this is like his optimistic es estimate and the pessimistic es estimate. The green here is good forest. The black is just totally detonated non-forest. And then the red and yellow is something in between secondary forest, burn forest, which doesn't hold the same species complexes as good quality forest. And what you can see is that, especially the Southwest, this area is just totally destroyed. And this is the result of a lot of agriculture. It's the result of soybean farming, believe it or not. Soybeans are a huge problem for Amazonia and also cattle ranching. And um, the area that we're gonna be talking about is this area here, the Belen area, and you can see it's just hacked to bits. Now, at this point, we're probably more towards the optimistic side of things than the pessimistic side of things, but even the optimistic side is not good for some areas. So the Belen area really only has a few large patches left. And if you go to a place like the Belen area, this is what you see. This used to be primary rainforest. And you can see that on the roadside here, you cannot really see a tree. I mean, there's some little specks here on the horizon miles away that are just individual emergent trees that are sitting here. And if you get far enough away um, from civilization, you start to get little patches of forest. Some of this is secondary. Um, some of it is patches of primary forest or partially logged forest, but 
it's not the greatest quality stuff and it's highly, highly fragmented, which is a problem. So the area that we went to, um, so basically this is the mouth of the Amazon. This is the city of Belém. Um, you can see Belém here on the map, right here on Bahia, Bahia de Marajó, which is like tidally influenced. The Atlantic Ocean comes in and out there with the tide. Um, and we basically um, went to this little patch of green here. And if we zoom in on the right here, you can see this patch of green. And this is really one of the biggest remnants of this Belém area of endemism. You can see there's a little bit more here. This is this is an area called Paraguaminas. Um, and the rest of it, pretty much gone other than fragments. So not a lot of places to go. So why does this matter? Well, it turns out there are things that are endemic to this area. And here's an example of that. So if you've spent time in Amazonia um, on a birding trip, almost certainly you've seen this thing, the ruddy spine tail. It's a very common spine tail that's found in the understory. And um, it's found across the entire basin. And across almost the entire basin, these birds look like this, a rusty bird with a black throat and a spiny tail. Um, and these are members of what are called the oven birds. Uh, they're related to wood creepers and things. Now in the Belay area, the ruddy spine tail looks like this, radically different. If I showed my kids a picture of these two things, they would say, oh, these are different species, right? Obviously. And the interesting thing is the Museo Gelbi did not have tissue samples of this thing. Even though they live, their museum is in this area of endemism, they had no tissue samples because we often don't spend time collecting near our own homes, um, unfortunately. And that's actually important to have specimens of this to be able to compare it genetically with these guys to ask the question, are they genetically different? Um, which they are. Um, and what that means is we need to make sure that we protect patches here. And there are many other species that follow this same story. This just gives you a sense of what Belém is like. It's a big city. It's a huge city in the middle of the Amazon. If you come in off the water from the middle of the Amazonian wilderness, you see a big city with big buildings sticking out of the, you know, the um, sticking up on the horizon. And this is home to the Museo Gelbi, which is the has the largest collection of Amazonian birds in the world. This is the building that that collection is in. Um, it's a very well curated collection used by researchers from all over the world. And thanks to my colleague, Alex Lalesho, colleague, my colleague and friend, um, they have among the largest tissue collections of Amazonian birds in the world now too. And this is just the crew that we have worked with over the years. So this is Alex Alesho, Fachi Malima, here I am. Um, this is Josh Engel, you know Josh. This is Vassal Catch. This is one of my undergrads, um, Nathan Troutenberg, who was an undergrad from Northwestern University that worked for me at the Field Museum. And he was a Portuguese miner and decided he wanted to go to Brazil for the summer. So we set him up with Alex and he went and worked in Alex's lab sequencing DNA in Belém and got to practice Portuguese and learn all about the culture in Brazil. It was a great opportunity. Um, and then, then a bunch of Brazilian students that went with us and um, just a lot of great colleagues there. Now, this is typically how we travel when we're in the Amazon. We often go by boat because rivers are usually a lot better than the roads in Amazonia but there were no major rivers that go to the, the area that we were going to. So on most trips, I would be showing you pictures of a, of a bunch of boats, you know, starting on a big boat, then getting to a smaller boat and then going up a river, up a river, up a river until we're in the middle of nowhere. In this case, we drove by truck. Um, this is Milton Santa Brigida, who is the um, taxidermist from the Geldi. So he helps prepare specimens. And these are our three drivers that got us out to our field sites. And this is just us packing up the truck. So you put all your gear in the back of the truck, you of course wrap it up in tarps because you're gonna go on a dusty, dirty road for sure. And there's a good chance you might run into a giant rainstorm. So you gotta keep your stuff dry. So that's just loading up the trucks. And for many hours, probably six to eight hours, we were actually on nicely paved roads. You know, it wasn't unlike driving in the countryside in Illinois somewhere, pretty open, um, just tropical instead. And then eventually we got off the road. So we, you know, we had a nice lunchtime, late lunch, and then very quickly got onto this dirt road. And this is the beginning of this reserve. So basically this sign is basically telling you that this is a, um, a protected area. We had a key to the gate. And once we got through, we locked the gate behind us. And what's interesting is um, when, you, when you get through these gates like this to the other side, um, there are actually are cattle ranches. So there is protected forest, but also it's surrounded by cattle ranches in, within the reserve. And you can see there's forest here and there are typical forest birds there. We drove through patches of forest. This is some secondary forest um, and some partially log forest, but 
there were birds like harpy eagles in this forest. So we saw harpy eagle. We saw, Josh and I saw crested eagle on this trip, which was pretty fantastic. It actually flew in and landed right in a tree, right, right up above us and put on a show for us. Um, and we basically lived in this house. So this is the owner of the house. He's basically, um, this reserve was owned by a company and sold to the government. And I guess the government hasn't fully paid for the reserve. So he works for the company guarding this property to make sure that nothing happens to it until things are paid off. Um, and we basically set up our little field laboratory under, under the house here in the shade and then slept in hammocks. Um, in, in, uh, oh, actually, no, sorry, we slept in tents. Some of us slept in hammocks in the house, but we mostly set up tents. So here's my tent um, just in the um, little grove of fruit trees out behind the house. This is our water source. So there was no stream. We often will bathe in a stream or if we're on a boat, we can actually have a shower. But in a site like this, basically he put up a little barrier of wood um, and you, um, you threw this, this bucket down into the well, ro you know, rolled it up, filled a big bucket up with water, and then you poured water over your head to take a shower in the evening. And actually most of us would take a shower twice a day because when you go into the forest, it is hot. Pretty much about, I would say, 30 minutes after it's light out, you're already soaking wet from sweat. So um, you wanna wash up, you know, even in the midday just to feel good. What's nice about a place like this is they grow all kinds of things. So this happens to be a special kind of manioc called makashera, which is a white manioc that you can just boil up or you can fry it up. And this is just us picking some of this manioc um, to eat it um, for dinner. And then we carry in all of our food. So we loaded the back of those trucks with a lot of stuff. A lot of that stuff was rice, beans, crackers, oil, a lot of basics that, um, that'll, that'll, that we, that'll last a while, that'll keep us going for the time that we're there in the field. And here we are eating lunch. So me, Josh, and Vassal um, after coming in from the field. Now, most of us, you know, in the morning, it would actually be cool, right? And cool to the point where you did not sweat but I would call it comfortable. I could walk around in shorts and a t-shirt in that cool weather, but our driver, he thought it was freezing. So he has every piece of clothing he has wrapped around him like, you know, like a scarf because he's freezing in the morning. Meanwhile, probably about a half an hour later, I'm sweating, you know, so it just gives you a sense of what, what folks down there consider cold. Um, and then we go and we work in the field, we set up mist nets. So this is a big line of mist nets, probably about 40 mist nets in one or two lines. And um, these are basically fine mesh nets that are a lot like a hair net um, that the birds don't see. So if you're banding birds, it's how you capture birds. Um, and this is just Josh untangling a bird from, from the nets. The birds just passively land in these, in these nets. And we work these nets in different kinds of habitats so that we're sampling a broad diversity of the birds and therefore also a broad diversity of their parasites. Um, and this is Heather Skeen who was, um, a technician at the Field Museum at the time and is now a PhD student at U of C finishing her PhD, also studying bird parasites and pathogens. Um, and this is her with, um, with one of the um, ant birds that is a flock leader. So this is a Thamnomanes ant shrike that leads all of the mixed species flocks. And I'll show you some close up pictures of these guys later. Um, one of the other things that we do is we do a lot of bird song recording. So another way that you can document diversity other than specimens is by having recordings. So Josh spent a lot of time recording bird songs at the site. So this is what's called a shotgun microphone. It's very directional and allows you to pick up sounds at a distance and get really nice quality recordings. Um, and then this is just uh, two, uh, two of the students. Um, so Sydney Dantas actually came to the Field Museum for about six months and worked with me and John Bates. Um, actually, he might have been a postdoc at this point. Um, and then Greg Tom was a graduate student in the Gelby. And this is Alex Alasia, who I've been friends with for over 20 years now. Um, and the two of us have done so many expeditions together that I can't even remember how many. Um, we, we, we often joke around that it, it's like we're married to each other because we spent so much time, you know, sleeping in hammocks next to each other. Um, and this is just our little workflow during the day. So Heather and Josh were here at this little table taking blood samples from birds. I was collecting ectoparasites. Greg and Sydney were preparing bird specimens. Um, so was um, Milton, the preparator. And um, Antonita was collecting tissue samples and then handing the guts to Vassal to dissect with his microscope to look for endoparasites. So it's this whole workflow to keep track of what's coming from where. And we have all kinds of notebooks to keep track of all this stuff 
So it's a real team effort to process everything. And we're often up late into the night. And here's just Josh with the parasite field notebook, um, filling out a, a special label that goes with each specimen and follows it through the whole workflow. And then here's Josh spinning blood in little chromatocrit tubes to separate blood and plasma for a project that we were doing with somebody. Um, and then here's Vassal dissecting at the table, um, all of us working at night. Um, so when it gets dark, you pull out the headlamps and you keep on working until you're done with everything. And then you go to bed. So sometimes you're up till three in the morning. Sometimes you're up till one in the morning. Uh, sometimes you're only up till midnight. And when that happens, you're very happy. Um, just some fun pictures of people smiling and working away in the field. Um, it was really a great group of people. We, we worked really well together and had a lot of fun together. So um, that's always a sign of a good expedition. And of course, on these trips, we see lots of critters, not just birds. We see amazing beetles, um, moths like this crazy moth with this bright coloration. Um, things like this scorpion, which I don't know if you noticed the table that we had, but the table was a makeshift table made out of a ladder and some pieces of wood. And I was actually ruffling birds for their parasites. We ruffle their feathers and knock the parasites off onto paper and then pick them up with a paintbrush. And while I'm doing that, I noticed something move on the table right in front of me. And I looked down and this scorpion was right in front of me on the side of the table walking. So of course I you know, moved my hands back. I, I literally almost rested my hand on the scorpion. We stood back and fortunately we have tweezers. So we grabbed it with tweezers and carried it away and then had fun taking pictures of it um, as we let it go. But that was, that was a close call. Um, and you, you have a lot of close calls with things like spiders. On, on this trip, you know, there's huge, huge armadera spiders one day I put my hand on one, you know, I just leaned up against a post, not knowing that the spider was there. I felt the spider underneath my hand and, you know, and I'm a little bit arachnophobic. So um, shockingly, um, so that, that scared me. Um, there are things like this, um, this whip scorpion um, or amblyo pigeon is what they're called. This was actually looking down into that well. So if you put your headlamp on at night, when you're taking a shower, if you're dumping that bucket down into the well to pick up water, there were zillions of these am amblyo pigeons. And you know, they're like this big with huge legs and these crazy um, mouth parts, and also a bunch of tarantulas living inside of that thing. So my worst nightmare was that I was gonna put the bucket down there, fill it up and roll the thing up and it would be you know, filled with a bunch of these crazy creatures. Fortunately, it never happened because I don't think I would have wanted to scoop one of those onto my head while I was taking a shower. Um, if you spend time in tropical forests, and this could be in Central America or South America in the lowlands, you have probably seen these ants. Um, these are called bullet ants and they're very large. They're, um, you know, over an inch, about an inch and a half um, in size. And these are called bullet ants because they're extremely painful, they sting. And um, they also call them 24 hour ants because the, the pain lasts for 24 hours or more. They cause your lymph nodes to swell up. Um, in all the years that I've been in the tropics, I have been lucky to never have been stung by one of these guys, but I am very careful to get out of their way. So if I'm sitting on the forest floor and one starts walking my way, I get up and let it do whatever it wants to do. And, and there were a lot of these bullet ants at this site. So you had to be really careful about where you where you sat down. And I, I think part of that is because it was a somewhat disturbed site that it had some um, selective forestry. Um, these ants were common. Now, there were also a lot of primates here, which is a good sign. You know, it's a good sign that there is, um, that there's not a lot of hunting. Um, so howler monkeys were really common. Um, and there were lots of parrots. Now, most of these pictures are either mine or vassal catches. There are a couple of pictures I'm going to show you here that are not mine, and that's because I don't have good, good enough pictures of these birds. Um, these are a couple of the parrots that were really common at the site. So we saw these, um, these red and blue macaws, uh, sorry, red and green macaws almost every day flying over camp. Again, another good sign that the forest is, is pretty well intact, because when the forest isn't, macaws disappear. Um, these yellow and green parrots are fantastic. These are called golden parakeets. And these are endemic to this region and one area of endemism over in Amazonia, the Shingu area of endemism. This is the only place on earth where you can see these things. So if you wanna see them, you have to go to that spot. And there are tour companies that lead tours um, to this area. And maybe you guys can convince you know, Josh to do a tour there someday. Um, 
And this one is a little bit of a different story. This parrot on the left is called um, the Jandaya parakeet. And um, these are very similar to sun conures, if you've ever seen them um, in captivity. Now, these are very much open country birds, and these are very new to this area. And these are actually a sign of degradation. So we find them, we would find them around the house, in the, um, in the fruit groves. They're now in the city of Belém because as forest has been cut down, they've moved in from the south. So it's an open country bird that's moved in. So there are two signs of good forest, one sign of not good forest in the parrots that we were seeing there. Um, these are also two photos that are not mine, but um, these are birds called um, horned screamers. And screamers are what we call the sister group to waterfowl. So these are close relatives of ducks, geese, and swans. And they are absolutely insane birds. So first of all, they soar like vultures at times. So in the midday, you'll see them soaring around with the vultures over the forest floor. They spend time around flooded areas, ponds. So there were some ponds along the roadside that we would find these. And what's cool is this is a picture of the spine on the, on the shoulder of the wing. So you, you can see it in this bird in flight. It's got a gigantic spine that the um, individuals use to battle with each other. So males competing for females will battle with these spines. And they have a really fantastic vocalization. I'll, I'll do my best to imitate it. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it over Zoom, but they kind of go. <laughs> That's why they call them screamers. They make this really crazy, crazy sound. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a classic um, Amazonian bird. Um, if, you, if you spent time in Amazonia, a cool bird to see. Well, we did get to sample one of these things for parasites. And this is what its wing feathers looked like. So you can imagine this sucker was loaded with parasites. So these are all mite eggs and they're all empty mite eggs. So the mites hatched out of all these eggs that are glued to the, um, the bases of the barbs, the feathers along the wing. This thing was one of the filthiest birds I've seen in terms of parasite loads, pretty crazy. And the interesting thing is one of the reasons that we were interested in collecting this is that Vassal is an expert on the liver flukes that live inside of waterfowl. And these are flukes that are transmitted by snails. So ducks typically have these. So he was very excited to sample a screamer thinking that it would be filled with these things. Well, it turns out this thing had a clean gut. It did not have any endoparasites, but was loaded with ectoparasites. So I was really happy. Vassal was not very happy. Um, it's strange what makes you happy when you're a scientist, right? Um, another bird that has one of these crazy spines is a jasana. And if you've, if you've been to the southern U.S. in Texas or Arizona, maybe you've been lucky enough to see a jasana there. This is a different species. This is wattle jasana, not northern jasana. Um, and both wattle and northern jasanas have these spines. And what's interesting about these is that it's the females in this case that actually are fighting over males. So these are, um, in, in, in this situation, females have many male mates. And the females lay their eggs in nests that the males make and the males guard and take care of. So one female just lays her eggs all over the place in all these male nests and lets the males do all the work for her. It's, a, it's different than most bird situations. And this is just me with one of these um, wattle jasanas. And this just shows you what their feet are like. They have crazy long claws and toes. And this allows them to walk on water lilies in flooded areas and in marshes really well. So they're, they're wet, wet habitat, marshy kinds of birds. Uh, this is a bird you could see in South Texas too. Um, this is a parake, and it's a night jar that spends most of its time vocalizing from the ground. And you can just walk right up to these things, um, you know, and take a photo like this. As long as you're slow and careful, especially if you shine a flashlight at them, they let you walk up pretty close. Um, and if you go down to South Texas, you can hear and see them at Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park, for example. Um, we saw lots of interesting hummingbirds. Um, so this one's called a fiery-tailed allbill, and you can see why it's called an allbill. It's got this really weird upturned bill. And um, I unfortunately don't have a picture of the tail, but the tail is like this metallic fuchsia color. If any of you did it, I'm not sure if any of you saw the, the mango that was in Wisconsin a bunch of years back. Um, mangoes have the same color tail, this weird iridescent fuchsia color. And then this hummingbird is an amethyst wood star. It's a little, little teeny hummingbird. It's insect size. You can see, I mean, that's my thumb holding that bird right there. Um, you can imagine how teeny that hummingbird is. It's smaller than the tip of my thumb in a lot of ways. Um, it's, its body is anyways. 
And then this is a long tail hermit, which is one of the bigger understory forest hummingbirds that specializes on feeding on heliconius, which are these big banana leaf banana relatives that have these beautiful red flowers. And this is a really interesting bird. Um, Josh was pretty excited about this. Um, this is called cryptic forest falcon. And um, its, it's scientific name was, um, was named after a guy that Josh has actually led on tours. And that's one of the reasons he was excited to take a picture so he could send this guy uh, photos of the bird. And what's interesting about this bird is it was described in 2003, a bird of prey described in 2003, hard to believe, right? And what's interesting is that um, this bird was just thought to be the same thing as a bird called line forest falcon, which is found across the basin. And a guy named Andy Whitaker, who's also a tour leader, was working in Kashwana National Forest, which is the next area of endemism over from the Bailing area. He heard a forest falcon call and noticed that it was different, recorded it, taped it in, and the bird that he saw looked like a line forest falcon. So it, he kind of got confused because it sounded nothing like any line forest falcon he knew about. In the end, um, he started looking at specimens and collections and realized that these two different populations on either side of the Madera River, so basically all the things in the Southeast, which includes the Belen area, have a certain number of tail bands. And then the other area, the birds in the other areas in Western Amazonia have a different number of tail bands and they have different vocalizations as well. And it turns out they're genetically different too. So basically he described this as a, as a, um, a, a new species um, and, What's interesting is that um, this thing was known from the Atlantic forest as well, which is another area of endemism separate from Amazonia. It's, it was known from specimens, but was not known in life. And what's interesting is while we were on this expedition in 2013, people rediscovered the living population of these things in Espirito Santo in um, Southeastern Brazil. So this, this new species was rediscovered in the southeastern part of its distribution as well. And it happened to be the year that, that, that we're sitting here in the field um, catching them in our nets as well. So pretty, pretty cool. Um, one of the fun things that, that we get to do is um, look up, you know, spend time watching the canopy. And this is how you do it. You get yourself a crazy creek chair so you don't have to sit on the dirt. Um, there, are, there are risks of sitting on the dirt in tropical forests. You can get some parasites that way. I, I can tell you about that another time. Um, but we were basically enjoying a fruiting tree. Um, and this, this fruiting tree called a Cecropia brings in all kinds of birds and all kinds of monkeys. So it's fantastic. So we went early in the morning before it was light, got set up here and then just leaned back and enjoyed the show. And you know, we saw things like this black necked Arasari, um, lettered Arasari, like I said, all kinds of different monkeys, pretty fantastic. And that was actually our last day at the site, a pretty fun thing to do in the last day. Um, lots of other interesting birds that have interesting stories here. And um, this one is called a grayish mourner and it kind of looks a little bit boring, um, but it has these really interesting scutes on its legs. That's one of the things that differentiates it from its, its look-alike. And it, it, it has a look-alike that is um, thought to involve mimicry. In other words, these two birds look alike because one is mimicking the other. And we don't know for sure. Um, this is called a scenarius mourner. And you can see if I flip back and forth, those are pretty similar, but the Cenarius mourner doesn't have these weird legs of the grayish mourner, and they're not actually all that closely related. Um, and this shows you these little orange spots that are on the wings of this, um, this grayish mourner. Now, the story gets even more complicated than that, and that's that baby grayish mourners, you may have seen this online years ago, baby grayish mourners turn out to look really crazy. So you see the little orange spots on the wings here? Well, they look that orange all over their entire body. And these babies, it turns out that if they sit in the nest and if you come to the nest and disturb them, they start writhing around. And they look very much like a caterpillar that you find in Amazonia. And this is a picture of that caterpillar. It kind of looks like Donald Trump's hairdo, right? Um, this crazy orange mess, right? Um, well, you don't want to touch that crazy orange mess. If you do, um, it will burn your, your skin. Like it will cause, it will sting you. And that the locals basically say that it burns your skin. Um, so the bottom line is this young, these young uh, scenarius mourners are mimicking a noxious caterpillar. So there's all kinds of weird mimicry going on in this bird group uh, that involves the nestlings mimicking caterpillars and then birds potentially mimicking each other. We don't really know exactly why. 
It turns out if you go to the western side of the Andes to the lowlands there, there's a rusty colored mourner of two types that mimic each other as well. And we don't know what their babies look like, but there's 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 repeated stories here on the evolutionary history of these things and mimicry. Um, the other thing is if you go to the tropics, you're gonna see lots of wood creepers and you're gonna have to learn how to tell them apart. Um, this is a wedge-billed wood creeper, super common wood creeper, short bill with this little upturned, um, upturned lower mandible. And then this is a bigger wood creeper called plain brown wood creeper. And plain brown, brown wood creepers sometimes follow army ant swarms. Not always, but sometimes. And this is one of uh, image of an army ant swarm. And this is like a, um, a big soldier in these swarms. And of course, these things sting and they bite. And what's cool about these is that there are birds that follow these army ant swarms. And they don't follow the swarms to eat the ants. They follow the swarms to eat the creatures that are being chased by the ants. So the ants are actually hunting insects and scorpions and all kinds of things on the forest floor. And the birds are following to take advantage of that. So as the insects get flushed by the ants, these big columns of ants, the birds jump in and grab them. And um, as a birder, it's a pretty exciting thing when you find an army ant swarm. And you find it because you can hear these chur notes that these ant followers make. They're very distinct chur call notes. And when you hear one of those, you go towards it and you find the army ants. And if you're wearing rubber boots, you can walk right into the army ant swarm. You just don't wanna move around a lot. If you move around, the ants will crawl up your boots and eventually will bite you. But if you stand still, they'll crawl up your boots and crawl right back down. They won't bite you and it's harmless and you can stand still and watch this whole natural history phenomenon unfold in front of you. And you often will get great views of some of these army ant followers. And here are a few of them. So on the right here, we have scale-backed ant bird, and this is a male and a female. And what's really cool is these have a lot of geographic variation. So in some parts of the basin, the males have black throats, in some parts they don't. They have lesser amounts of scaling on them in some parts of the basin. And John Bates has done a bunch of work on this, as well as some other researchers. And we know that these different populations are genetically different. And um, there has been one gen there's one, been one split made, and there probably are others that will be made in the future dividing these into multiple species. Um, and then this is called a white-backed fire eye, which is an obligate army ant follower. So, so this the, the scale-backed ant birds don't always follow army ants, but mostly follow army ants. But these other two always follow army ants. So you're not going to follow um, find white-backed uh, white fire eyes away from army ants, except when they're moving between swarms. Um, but they always feed at army ant swarms. And this is called a black-spotted bear eye. A lot of these army ant followers have these weird bare skin patches. We don't know exactly why, but, um, but they do. And they're beautiful, gorgeous birds. Now, these are what often people think of when they think of ant birds, but there's a whole diversity of ant birds that don't follow army ants. And here are just a few of them. So this is a white-shouldered ant shrike, a very common um, mid-story forest bird. And this is a long-tailed ant wren. And both of these are things that will follow mixed species flocks around the forest. And, um, Hang on, let me give my dog a cookie here. <laughs> there you go, buddy. <laughs> Keep him busy for a few more minutes here, hopefully. Um, yeah, so the bottom line is these don't follow army ant swarms, but they follow mixed species flocks, which are just one of the most amazing, another amazing phenomenon in the tropical rainforest is to, is to come upon one of these mixed flocks and just birds everywhere trying to figure out what they are before they move on to the next um, the next area and you can't follow them as fast as they can move, unfortunately. Um, if you go along little ponds, rivers, stream edges, um, you'll find this guy. This is an Amazonian streaked ant wren. So it's another small ant bird, very common along the edges, um, wet edges in Amazonia. And then we have things like ant thrushes. This is a rufous capped ant thrush. This is found walking on the forest floor. A lot like you find a wood thrush walking along the forest floor. They make beautiful vocalizations. And then another really diverse group of birds are the flycatchers, right? Even in the US, we have a tough time with things like MPIDs and telling them apart. In the neotropics, it's way worse. You have all these canopy flycatchers. You really have to know voices to tell them apart um, or you get them in the hand. These are ones that are actually identifiable. Um, so this thing, this whiskered flycatcher has a yellow rump. There is a lookalike species that you can find at some sites, but um, has these really beautiful whiskers. Um, this is an ochre-bellied flycatcher found across the Neotropics. Um, and there is a lookalike species in Amazonia that you can only tell by voice or by looking at the color on the inside of the mouth. Um, but we know that this one was, uh, was ochre-bellied because we had it in the hand. Um, and then this is called ruddy flycatcher. This one's 
pretty different than anything else. So fairly easy to ID. And then of course this spectacular guy, the Royal Flycatcher, which um, it's another one of these birds that's found from Central America all the way to the Atlantic forest. And it turns out different populations are genetically different. There are probably multiple species involved here. Um, and eventually this will be a split that will happen. Um, there will be a multiple species described. And almost certainly this iridescence on this crown has UV coloration. So birds see in UV, um, we do not, so we can't see it, but with a UV camera, you could see that. Um, and uh, let me just here. we're getting close to the end here. Um, this is a, a rufous-tailed jacamar, another widespread bird that you can find in edge all over the neotropics. These things commonly feed on butterflies. So you'll see them catch butterflies, pluck the wings, eat the body. Um, if you spent time in the tropics, you've probably seen a motmot. This is a blue crown motmot. A really, this is this is like the the classic morning sound that you're going to hear when you wake up in Amazonia. Typically from the forest understory in a thick tangle, you, these things will be vocalizing, and they sound like this. They go woo 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 woo. So when you hear that, you know it's a blue crown motmot. Um, and uh, this is just a close up of the face and the eye. I, one of the things I really enjoy is using a macro lens to get really close up shots of the heads of these things. I mean, just birds, birds are spectacular from afar with binoculars, but when you get up close, the things that you can see are just amazing. Um, this is another one of these mixed species flockers, a flame crested tanager, um, another really gorgeous bird that was very common um, at the site. And this is a sparrow. So this is a pectoral sparrow. So a forest understory sparrow that you'd find in Amazonia. Hold, hold on one second. Let me just see if I can get my son to come and get the dog because he is not happy. Hey, Badge. 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 Yeah. Can you come and get Bailey? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is a, a, you know, you don't find this in grassland. You find it in the forest. Um, and, um, if you have spent time in, uh, <laughs> Bailey's running away from Benji already. Um, if you spent time in Southeast uh, Arizona or Texas, you've probably heard of, of rose-throated Bacard. Well, this is one of the Amazonian Bacards. This is a Cenarius Bacard. And uh, again, a beautiful bird. This is a male, um, very common at our site on the edges. And what's cool is we have really different kinds of habitats, like local habitats. So you have upland, forest that we call terra firmi forest. And then you have river edge forest or stream edge forest. And along these streams and rivers, you find things like this atala. This is a cinnamon atala. Now there's another atala called bright runt atala that you would find in the upland forest. But in this, um, this river edge forest, you won't find the bright runt atala, you'll find this species. So that's one of the cool things is that these micro habitats also determine what things are found where. Um, and then smooth bill ani is certainly something that you're, you're familiar with if you've been down to Florida. They've become much less common in Florida, but they're found across Florida, the Caribbean, and they're very, very common in South America. Any field edge open area, marshy area is going to be loaded with these anis. And these are cooperative breeders. So many individuals lay their eggs into one nest and they all cooperatively take care of the young. Um, there's some interesting studies that have been done on their close relatives, the greater anis but really, really crazy behavior. Uh, and then guys like this mannequin, this is a white bearded mannequin, have great lecking displays where the males get in groups together and the males um, make mechanical sounds with their wings, wing snaps, and they display for the females. And this is a common edge bird that, um, that you see in a lot of South America. And um, I have two more bird pictures here to show you. Um, and they're kind of some of my favorites from the trip. So. This is a gnat eater. And gnat eaters are a group of birds related to things like fly catchers and ant birds um, and ant thrushes, but they're their own group, their own family called the Conopophagidae. And this is an, a gnat eater called the hooded gnat eater, which is endemic to the Bilang area of endemism. So this among several other things, um, you can only see if you go to the Bilang area. And we, we got to see this a bunch of times. It was one of my favorite birds of the trip. And then my other favorite, and mostly because I study them, um, is this one. Um, so I have to end on a toucan. So one of the groups that I work on are the Ranfastos toucans. And actually my lab has worked on all toucans and barbets. We have a study that we're about to publish on them um, in the coming months. And this is um, a particular subspecies of channel-billed toucan that's found in Southeastern Amazonia. 
So the Baleen area of endemism and next door, and it's also found in the Atlantic forest. So the ones in the Atlantic forest look exactly like this, except they're different in body size. The ones here in the Baleen area are smaller than the ones in the Atlantic forest. And it turns out that they're genetically different. So I have genetic data on these. And the genetic data tells an interesting story about um, in the past, the Atlantic forest and the Amazon were connected to each other and they have separated. And basically these Amazonian channel built toucans, which were once differentiated from the other Amazonian populations have now somewhat exchanged genes with them. So this population in the Amazon has some genes from the Amazon, some genes from the Atlantic forest and the Atlantic forest ones are, are entirely different um, in their genetic makeup at, at, some of the, at some of the genes that we've looked at. So it's a pretty weird story. Anyways, this is one of my favorite toucans. I think it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful toucans out there. Um, thanks for your attention. We shall stop the share. Right. Thank Fabulous. You, Thank you so much. <laughs> really exciting. Well, I have a bunch of questions I, I want to say, and I think Gary and Roberta Morris are also on. I mean, I've only been to um, Panama and Costa Rica once each, but looking at those <laughs> pictures makes me just dying to go back. You know, just the tropical birds are just wonderful. Oh yeah, you could go back, you know, I mean- Oh, 80 times. Yeah, exactly, 80 times and you're gonna see something. I mean, on every expedition I see, I see life birds. That's the cool thing. Yeah, I know. Um, let's see, uh, Cindy asked, what's the weirdest parasite you found on this trip? Who boy, what is the weird? I mean, I a think parasite, the- A parasite question, Jason. Yeah, that's good, see, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would have to say the um, the lice from the um, the screamer, that big duck relative. It had, first of all, it had so many. I mean, like I got vials of lice off of that thing. So I mean, it was gross. Um, and they're huge, so just immense, immense lice. Um, so that those are probably like in terms of the parasites that I study, those were the wildest things that 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 I collected. Vassal collected all kinds of crazy worms and things. So. He would, he would always say, hey guys, check out my scope. And we'd run over and we'd get to see these live parasites, these um, you know, liver flukes and moving around underneath his microscope. Um, so a lot of that stuff is crazy too. <laughs> Here's another parasite question. What's the worst personal parasite story you have? Is there? Uh, <laughs> so I've been pretty lucky. You know, so most, most biologists that have, you know, that have traveled this much, I mean, I. I don't know how many expeditions I've been on, but I spent over a year of my life in Brazil. Plus I've been to Nicaragua a couple of times, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, um, Argentina. So I, I've spent a lot of time in the Neotropics and Africa. I've never gotten bot flies. So most people have gotten bot flies that have spent that much time in the Neotropics. Um, maybe because I shower a lot. <laughs> I don't know. That's like one of the rumors that if you don't shower much, that it's, you're more likely to get them. Um, I don't know if it's true. Um, I've never gotten a, a worm in my gut. Um, and um, I have never gotten leishmaniasis, although people like John Bates and Dave Willard and John Fitzpatrick, they all got leishmaniasis, which is a protozoan parasite that you get from being bitten by a sand fly. And it can actually cause the cartilage in your nose to be eaten or your ears. And the treatment is intravenous antimony salts which are dangerous. You can actually have a heart attack if you're not, you know, taken care of properly. Um, so, and, and, and of course it's not easily treatable in the United States because there aren't a lot of doctors that have expertise. So Northwestern hospital has a tropical person. Well, so I've never gotten any of those, but one year John Bates and I were on a trip and we came home with sort of this mystery rash. You can ask John about his mystery rash the next time you see him. Um, and we were both scratching our, our behinds because we had the mystery rash on our behinds. And it was because we were sitting on the ground in sandy soil forest, it turns out. And we, we both thought we had fungus or you know God knows what. We put every over-the-counter cream you could imagine on this stuff and it wouldn't go away. You know, So weeks of like putting this cream on after we got home. And then I was on the phone with Alex Alasio, our colleague down there, and I said, John and I have this crazy rash that's not going away. You know, We don't know what it is. And, and he said, oh, I know what you have. And he, he said, I'm going to send you a link. And he emailed me a link. He said, it's called cutaneous larvae migrans. 
Um, and in Portuguese, they call it bicho geográfico, which means map critter. And you'll, you'll understand why that is in a minute. And I get to the site and sure enough, the rash that I have looks exactly like the picture. And it's a little trail of red on your skin. That's basically a little trail of dermatitis. And it's caused by a nematode, a hookworm that is basically a dog specific hookworm. So where we were was wilderness. So these were probably um, crab eating foxes or something. And basically they, they transmit this back to the soil. It lives in the soil, eats bacteria, then crawls into the foot of the, of the dog and goes through its life cycle in the gut of the animal. Well, in a human, we don't have the right receptors for it to find its way through our blood vessels to our lungs and then ultimately to the gut. So it gets stuck in our skin and it causes dermatitis. That's all it does is cause dermatitis. So itchy skin, but it's itchy skin for months. So you basically have to go to a dermatologist, get them to give you a bolus of this um, drug called embendazole, um, which is, I forget, eight, eight pills or something like that. You take them at once and it kills this nematode. Well, the dermatologist that I went to did not believe this is what I had. Obviously also didn't know what he was doing. John's dermatologist gave him a prescription right away and it went away. Mine ended up sending me to this tropical guy at Northwestern and it took weeks until he finally agreed to do it. He actually did a biopsy of the thing. Bottom line is it went away. It was fairly harmless. Um, I'll take it over leishmaniasis. <laughs> and you live to tell the tale. So I that's... live to tell the tale, yeah. A um, Couple more questions. Is there any concern about bird parasites jumping to humans when you're handling them? So, most of these things are extremely host specific. So these host switching events that happen, so we do know that host switching events happen. So for example, human malaria, human malaria ultimately came from birds over evolutionary time. So it switched from birds onto mammals and then between mammals onto humans ultimately. But this is what we call a macro evolutionary event. It was an event way long ago that happened once or a few times. And it's not something that happens constantly. So like I mean, you're all surrounded by birds that have malaria, believe it or not. There's avian malaria all over Illinois, all over Pennsylvania, but human malaria is gone from these areas. We're not gonna get malaria from a bird. Same is true of these ectoparasites. Um, there, there are some things like things like avian flu that you could potentially get, but it would be unlikely to get that from handling a bird. You would get that from some other form of transmission. Um, Sam asked this question and it's related to something I was going to ask. Sam said, sounds like very threatened habitats, which we know, what can we do to help conservation with these regions? And, and my parallel question is, what about the, what have the um, forest fires there um, done to some of the, these areas? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know the full answer about what the forest fires have done to this region. I mean, there are fires certainly in the area. Now, one of the issues is that area is so hacked to bits, there's not much more to burn, right? So the areas that have been principally burning have been in the South where there is a lot of forest to burn and where there's a lot more soybean growing. Where we were, it was less soybean growing. Um, and um, what can you do to help? Um, you know, there aren't a lot of tourist opportunities, but there are tours that do go to that area. Um, I think the more that there is, some value seen to protecting that area. Um, you know, right now it's really just scientific and, and legal value. Like by law um, in Brazil, these ranches have to keep a certain percentage of their forest intact. Now, of course, the current president in Brazil is not very uh, pro-conservation. He's very much um, pro-agriculturalist. So um, it's, it's a real problem um, because Basically, the agriculturalists are taking advantage of that and breaking the law and cutting forest and burning forest. Um, so I think going to these places, um, working with conservation organizations um, or giving to conservation organizations that are protecting the areas. Now, I don't like places like American Bird Conservancy. I don't even know if they have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the Billing area. Um, it's mostly you know, regional conservation or federal conservation that's led to the, um, like we were in a national forest, essentially, that uh, that that, um, that reserve is, is nationally protected. Um, but it doesn't really have tourist infrastructure. So there's no, right. you know, there's no lodge you can go to, um, you know, to see those birds. There are, there are places, you could stay in Belém and do day trips to some smaller nearby reserves. And even that would be beneficial. 
Got it. All right, I'll ask the last question. How many bird species did you see on this expedition? Do you know? Who boy, off the top of my head. How long were you there, Jason? We were, we, it was a shortish trip. It was only like 12 days or so, like just under two weeks or around two weeks. Um, you know, some of the time we're in the city getting stuff and shopping. Um, you know, I am guessing we saw um, high 300s uh, and that includes herd too. Um, it could, we could have gotten into the 400s. I can't remember off the top of my head. And how many um, of those were endemic to that region? Well, um, if you sort of count subspecies, I would say approximately half of the subspecies would be endemic, um, species and subspecies, oh. um, you know, or a little less, a little less than that. Now, the issue is a lot of these things, no one's actually really, like there may not be a named subspecies, but no one's really looked to see, are they genetically different? They might look the same as the ones next door. They might not be, uh, they might be genetically different. Um, the same is true of a part of the Atlantic forest. If you sort of look at the hump of Brazil, there's Atlantic forest that has a lot of Amazonian species in it. And it has Atlantic forest endemics and Amazonian species. And those Amazonian species are way distant from any other Amazonian population. So they must be genetically distinct. Um, and there are some papers coming out on that now, um, but there's a lot more to do to study that kind of stuff. Um, all right, we had one more question and then, th then we'll cut it off. Where do they export soybeans? Maybe the US needs to reduce demand. <laughs> yeah, that's actually something you could do is, you know, not buy Brazilian beef, not buy um, products that use. And the thing is we use soybeans for a lot of stuff, everything from ink to, uh, you know, different kinds of lubricants to soybean oil to um, the veggie burger that, that, you know, we may like to eat. Um, like. We're not innocent in any way, no matter what we do, we are using resources. So I think being, cog I mean, even in Illinois, there are a lot of soybeans and that's a major destructor of, of, of prairie habitat. So um, soybeans are yummy and, um, but they don't always have positive effects. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I yeah, thanks for having me. Who attended and, um, Let's hope we can travel again soon. Maybe not to the Belém region, but <laughs> somewhere in Amazonia, I'm ready. Yep. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you Good night. for joining us. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Good night. Super program. Thanks. Bye, fellas. Good night. <laughs>